the Pars Mr. Kantor Ilke Foundation for the presentation. We have a special guest today, Dr. Vasil Mustafa from England, Oxford University. Uh, uh, one year ago, you retired, I think. Uh, several times he came in Turkey. Uh, during Ramadan, he was here. This is my first Ramadan. First Ramadan in Turkey. Yeah. He was very happy. Uh, inshallah, next year we will come together again during Ramadan and later. Uh, the topic, value-based leadership and Islamic perspective, we will listen today. Uh, yes, welcome to Turkey and our foundation. We are ready to listen to you. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Professor Nihat, Professor Lutfi Sunar, thank you very much for inviting me to join you today on this occasion. And uh, this is my second visit to Ilki. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless those who work here and those who are associated with it and the work of the foundation itself. Uh, let, before I start uh, waiting for my script to arrive, let me just ask a general question. How many of you, just by a show of hands, how many of you have read something about this topic, which is values-based leadership, in the literature or online? One, two, three, four, Five and six. Okay, so some of you may not have, some of you have already uh, uh, had an introduction to the topic itself. Um, I will try and uh, speak slowly today. I will try and introduce the subject and why is it important um, uh, to, to us. Now, First of all, the first slide is what is leadership? And of course there are hundreds of definitions for leadership. But the one that I prefer is used by Professor Rosalind Moskanta. She describes leadership as the art. Interesting, she uses the word art, not science. The art of leadership is to inspire action and guide people in productive directions. And there are two key elements of this definition, that is inspiration and guidance. So leaders are expected to inspire others, who work with them, who are around them, stakeholders, you can uh, mention those, and also guide them into productive directions. Now, thank you very much. Why is then values-based leadership important? What is so important about it? That's the first question I would like to explain. The importance of values to global business initiatives is a well-researched topic in academia. Values lie at the core of any leadership theory and business strategy. In fact, if you are familiar with someone called Michael Porter, he is the guru of strategic management in the US. His earlier book in 1980 about business strategy lists four principles, four important concepts. One of them is for the management of the organization, of the company, uh, to have its own core values. So that was in 1980, more than 40 years ago. They were talking about values in a business context. The leader's personal values are known to have great impact on the construct of any uh, public service organization, like schools, hospitals, or any corporate business uh, organization. Uh, values like trust, accountability, integrity, empathy are all important to how efficient organizations are run, 
whether these are for public services or private corporate businesses. To summarize it to you, Professor Robert Solomon of the University of Texas, drawing on 20 years of experience consulting with major corporations on ethics, maintains that personal integrity leads to corporate success. Personal integrity leads to corporate success. He clarifies that business ethics should be viewed as a motivating force to business behavior, contrary to its popular perception as a set of impositions or organizational constraints, as some would argue. Now, of course, leaders who are altruistically motivated, demonstrating a genuine caring and concern for people and society, are thought to be individuals of integrity, who make ethical decisions and who become models for other stakeholders. Now, those leaders are found to be more effective. Now, Professor Rosabeth described it as the art of leadership. My second slide is about the science of leadership. And this is a recent book, uh, was published in Canada, which is based on uh, empirical uh, data to prove that uh, leadership can make a difference to organizational, call it output, uh, that could be quality of service, it could be quality of products, it could be whatever they are to do, it could make effect based on empirical evidence. And that's why the, the book itself called The Science of Leadership. So there is, ladies and gentlemen, I want to assure you, there is strong positive correlation between values and business performance using return on assets, sales, service criteria, whatever criteria you choose, there is a strong positive correlation between values of the, call it the leader, the management, the chief executive, the executive board, and the organizational performance. And there are numerous papers that have been published in the last 10 years to give you that kind of evidence. Uh, especially for medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, people have found, for example, that leaders' humility could create a lot of uh, ideas, and those ideas will then benefit the company through making better products, better sales, and better profits at the end of the day. And those of you, those of you who are interested in gathering this evidence, I'm quite happy to give you my email, and then I can send you those links and the evidence of all those. Uh, uh, papers that were published in the field. Very glad to Thank you. So, having established that, what are the benefits of values based leadership? They are listed as enhanced motivation and workplace engagement. I want to concentrate on workplace engagement. It's a very um, relevant concept to people who work in uh, management and finance and other places. Uh, workplace engagement, of course, is a factor that affects organizational performance. In the UK, in the UK, in the United Kingdom, workplace engagement or disengagement costs cost the country 
there are various estimates, but people are talking about 50 billion pounds a year. 50 billion pounds a year because workers are disengaged from their workplace. So basically, how do they know they are disengaged? There are many faulty products which gets returned. This costs money. They become absent from work, so they take what they call sick leave, which costs the company money. Thirdly, they leave the company, and therefore they will have to be replaced. So recruitment and retraining of new employees will cost money. So almost every year, the UK economy loses about 50 billion pounds because of poor workplace engagement. Um, I've read some statistics about Turkey, about other countries in the Middle East. I leave that to you. There is a Gallup annual survey of workplace engagement, which gives results country by country, and that you can follow. But it's a very important. So values-based leadership reduces workplace disengagement, increases workplace engagement, and that's why it is important. Secondly, it increases talent retention and reduces staff turnover, generate higher level of customer satisfaction, and also higher performing teams. So there is also uh, uh, a theory, leadership theory, which is called authentic leadership theory. Authentic leaders basically are those who create an environment of trust and they act on their principles and therefore they act with integrity. Hence, they are termed values-based leaders. Authentic leadership is one of those theories that argue Bill George used to be the, the, the author, he used to be the a chief executive of Metronics, and now he's a professor at uh, Harvard Business School. He coined this term, authentic leadership. So authentic leadership is one of the theories that contribute to what we call values-based leadership in the workplace. Um, I will not dwell too much on this theory, but just to draw it to your attention. One final piece, ladies and gentlemen, which I thought is necessary that I should bring it to your attention. There is a World Economic Forum, which you all know about. It, it has a Global Agenda Council. So a group of about 25 worldwide experts who meet together over a two-year period on a particular theme in mind, and then they issue their report. They call it a white paper. So the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council for 2014-2016 was dedicated to looking at values in the workplace. And what they have said is this. Today society faces the mammoth task of creating one and a half billion new livelihoods by 2050 for the whole world. While at the same time, they want to keep to the planet's crucial ecological limits. With all that, and the background of the fourth industrial revolution, human progress, the report says, may either suffer through a catastrophic setback or experience a positive transformation. So there are two, two like poles. Either a catastrophic setback for this aim, or positive transformation of human societies to be able to adapt to the target of one and a half billion new livelihoods by 2050. What will make the difference between this and that result? Catastrophe or success? These experts have concluded that the one difference is brought up by values in the world. This is their report, you can see it online. It's a full white paper report and talks about many of these uh, aspects, which indicates that really values-based leadership 
is an important part of any business or corporate strategy. That is the conclusion uh, that we arrived uh, at in about, uh, we arrived at in about 10 minutes. Uh, so, values. Uh, what values? We'll come to that. It's more contextualized, of course. Now, role models are important. I have highlighted two for you. Knut Jair, uh, on the left-hand side, he was the chief executive for about 10 years of the Norges Investment Fund, which is the investment fund of Norway. It's the, it's the uh, yeah, national sovereign wealth, fund. sovereign wealth Fund. Thank you. Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway. He was chief executive for 10 years. He basically was in control of about $328 billion of investments worldwide. I met him in 2006 in London. He was attending a conference. I was there. We were having tea together in a place. So I gave him a cupcake. You know a cupcake is like a cake like this cupcake. It's about 10p, meaning very cheap. So I gave him a cupcake. He took the cupcake, probably squashed it too hard, and it fell into pieces. So it was crumbs, and it was scattered on the table. And I, I tell you this story as I lived through it. So I said, fine, this is another cupcake. And he looked at me like that, and he said, no, 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 no. This crumbs should not go to waste. He took his tissue, he collected the crumbs like this, and he started eating her with his hands. And this is a man in control of 328 billion pounds and doesn't want to waste crumbs from a, from a 10p cake. He must be driven by some values. Otherwise, why would he care about... And of course, it filters down to the way he runs his organization. And, and I don't have the time to give you how he runs his, his organization. On the other hand, we have a public servant leader, Nelson Mandela. Uh, he became president of South Africa uh, in... 1994, and uh, his aim, his uh, value was to build a new South Africa that is inclusive of all South Africans, not just for the black South Africans. Even though he was persecuted, he was imprisoned, he was tortured by the white South Africans, but he wanted to build a country on a, the value of inclusion. And here is a leader who worked according to his values and built that country during his, uh, his reign. And actually he managed to hold South Africa together as one country uh, and one people. You can read about his... Um, uh, biography uh, and, and what he said. This is what he said. One country, one nation, one people marching together into the future. This was his vision and his values. So there are a lot of other examples. I could go on talking about the new bank or a new society, Bank Real, Fabio Barbosa I mentioned, but really at the end of the day, you would probably say, okay, Cadbury, Cadbury, you know the, the chocolate company? Its, its slogan, its motto is performance-driven, values-led. 
That's Cadbury UK. Performance driven, values led. And you can, you can uh, read about uh, the philosophy of the founder of, uh, of Cadbury uh, and how he created uh, a company that endured for more than 150 years with success after success. And this is the argument that Professor Rosabeth Moss Counter develops in her book, Super Corp, uh, which was published in 2009, that success should not be measured in 5 or 10 or 20 years or 30 years. Success should be endured for a very long time into centuries and generations. And values-based leadership is necessary to ensure that kind of enduring success, corporate enduring success. Otherwise, what has led her and other Western scholars to talk about values-based leadership, and it's a notion only in the last 20 years uh, started, um, that there was a sequence of what we call uh, corporate scandals, which led to insolvency, led to collapse of companies. Some of them were less serious, but nevertheless damaging. You had the Enron in 2001, where the seventh largest corporation in the US collapsed. Uh, and uh, 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 then there was the, in England, for example, the BCCI Bank, the Bering Bank. Uh, more recently, you will remember the Volkswagen emission scandal uh, only 2015, five, six years ago, and so forth. So a series of corporate scandals have led these people to think, why is it? How can we help these corporations together and uh, its values of the senior management team and those who lead those companies that become important to their success and in viewing success. This is part A of my talk. Okay, some of you might say, where is Islam in all this? And I'm, and I'm sure, you know, I would probably say, where is Islam in all this? This is all. Yeah, so where is Islam? Now, in business schools, when it comes to education of new uh, business leaders, managers, they give them the role models of Knut Chair, of Cadbury, of Vodafone, of this company, and they train them on these models. Okay, now I visited countries in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Brunei, those regions. I visited countries in Central Asia. I visited countries in the Middle East and North Africa and there are millions and millions of workers and managers who do not even speak English, let alone visit other countries or go to business schools and pay high fees for their education in order to learn about, about these role models and the impact. So I said, Who's going to educate all those Muslim managers who cannot travel, who cannot afford to attend to business schools, and who cannot afford to attend executive education courses? How are they going to be trained uh, or developed in values-based leadership? That was my primary. How do we get to those people? Then we have to look at their history, at their tradition, and see we don't want Kunucher, we don't want Cadbury, we don't want Vodafone, we don't want Walmart. We don't want examples from those because to these people it may mean very little. We want something from their own Islamic tradition. And perhaps we can train them 
to develop the same strengths but using role models from their tradition, Islamic tradition. That was my, my aim, my question. Okay, where do you start from? Very obvious. Where do you start from? You start from the seerah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You, should, you can then carry on by looking at the seerah of the four rightly guided caliphs, by looking at many uh, scholars who have... I even briefly was reading a little bit about Ottoman history, and I found one certainly personality that was quite strong on this in the 16th century uh, Ottoman era. But the first step, I thought, will start with the seerah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Let's see if we can create a role model that could inform the same concepts, but through his actions and deeds. That was my concern. So I wrote, Muslim societies today are facing the primary challenge of managing the influences of modernization and globalization while maintaining their religious and social values to achieve balanced and sustainable development. So we want to be developed, we want to be economically developed, but we want to retain our values, social values and traditional values, family values, other values. Success in this encounter crucially depends on the quality of young leaders who are a potent force in shaping the future. Now, what kind of leaders we're looking for? I am certainly not one of those because I am a retired pensioner, so I'm not young anymore. But I can look at many faces in this room who I hope will be assuming that role in life. Now, those leaders should be able to discern a productive path in life while holding fast against selfish temptations and the competition for personal luxury and opulence. Because what happens? People become very good at what they do. But they get in their heads that this is all because they are good, because they have talents, they have skills, and therefore they are entitled to this. This is exactly what Surat al kahf was trying to discourage. There is a book by Abu Hassan Ali Nedwi called Faith versus Materialism. It was published 50 years ago, 1972. And he talks specifically faith versus materialism. That is the ultimate challenge of humanity. And where he derived all, uh, all these lessons is from Surah al kahf you remember, if you read Surah Al-Kahf, and I'll show all of them, there is this story about one person who's poor and another person who's very wealthy and has much, lots of lands and beautiful gardens, uh, grapevines and palm trees, and he was very wealthy and has lots of children. The wealthy man thought that he was privileged by God for having this wealth. And there is no need for him to be accountable to anyone. So no values. He is privileged. He was given this because he was good at what he does and talented. Now, his poor friend was saying to him, that is not right. You should be thankful to the Lord who bestowed all this on you. So there is this story. You can follow this. I don't want to take your time. But Surah al kahf basically resembles that struggle within humanity itself between faith in the heart and materialism. 
And this is where we need a new generation of leaders who, who will basically um, seek this verse, وَابْتَغِي فِي مَا آتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَأَحْسِنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ ولا تبغ الفساد في الأرض إن الله لا يحب المسلم. or in سورة الكهف it says المال والبنون your wealth and your children are the adornment of this world. المال والبنون زينة الحياة الدنيا. but what matters most is الباقيات الصالحة. so okay here we have a chief executive of a bank or any other institution who made it very well. So he drives a BMW or a, a, a better car and, you know, he does all this and he thinks he's entitled to it without reference to the creator and without reference to other stakeholders within the society itself. And that is what we want to change. We want leaders who think certainly of themselves, وَابْتَغِي فِي مَا آتَكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ but وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا as well, وَأَحْسِنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ So we want a leadership caliber that uh, exemplifies this, uh, this uh, attitude. I said, okay, it's all good, but how do you do that? How do you do that? So, let's... The answer is... Uh, sorry, uh, how do I have about... Sorry, minutes. No, I have... This. I, I'll take... No, I, I will not take more than 10 more minutes. Oh. I, I, yeah. Let me, let me emphasize uh, one or two things. There are two authors that published a book called Leadership by Oxford University Press, the most impressive publisher in the world. Their, their book is called Leadership, just Leadership. Their names are Izzet White and Saunders. In 2014, they published this book. They acknowledge, and I want to read, just... They acknowledge, and I quote, the current overemphasis on Western sources in the majority of leadership writings available to students today. So if you go to any business school, probably even Turkish universities' business school, if you go to any one of them, you will find plenty of Western sources that will teach you about leadership and leadership studies. They say leadership students, however, come from all over the world and want to see examples and names that they recognize and have resonance with their own cultural heritage and experience. If they can't find this, then they won't be able to engage themselves with the teaching. So my argument is that the seerah of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, provides a wealth of learning material that is valuable to use in professional training and personal development programs. It has the advantage of providing spiritual motivation in addition to enhancing professional skills. It is bound to be more impactful because it provides a learning experience in addition to imparting knowledge through the instructional content itself. So the seer of Prophet Muhammad, if adapted properly, it can be used as a resource material. Here I will give you some examples. So now, the Prophet Sallallahu wanted to send Mu'adh ibn Jabal 
to Yemen as a jurist, as a judge. He could have said to him, Mu'ad, I am sending you as a jurist. You will follow my instructions, draw your evidence from the Quran. If you couldn't find, draw your evidence from my sayings, tradition, or hadith. And if you couldn't find, then you can make your own judgment based on the two earlier. He could have said that, but that was not the conversation between the two. The conversation was the Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'ad, Mu'ad, I am sending you as a jurist. How will you judge between people? So he asked him a question. How will you judge between people? Mu'ad said, I will use the Quran. Then the Prophet, peace be upon him, prompted him further. What if you couldn't find any evidence from the Quran? Mu'ad replied, then I will use the Sunnah of the Prophet. The Prophet again prompted him even further by saying, and what if you couldn't find any evidence in the Sunnah of the Prophet. Mu'ad said, then I will derive my own opinion, allegorical reasoning, based on evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, was pleased with that. So some might ask, why, why was this approach prompting? Why was this, why did the Prophet use an inquisitive approach rather than a direct instructive approach. If you are a teacher in a school, okay, and leaders, doesn't, they don't have to be corporate leaders, by the way. They could be teachers in a school, parents are leaders within their family, grandparents are leaders within their social settings. Uh, leaders could be uh, uh, performing any role within society. So if you are a leader, uh, uh, the answer is you provide what we call intellectual stimulation to your followers. Intellectual stimulation. You don't have to provide all the answers, but if you enable them, if you empower them, if you incentivize them to find answers, then you are a leader, a true leader. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ was doing in that conversation between him and Mu'ad ibn Jabal. He was empowering Mu'ad to be creative, to find solutions for his own uh, new environment in Yemen. Now this is described in a theory called Transformational Leadership Theory. You can read about it, Bernard Bass, Chicago, 1985, in which he says, the leader's role must involve intellectual stimulation of followers or stakeholders. So I can use this example from the Sira to inform my managers, my workplace uh, people in Kuala Lumpur, in uh, Baghdad, in Tashkent, in other places in the world who cannot see, I can give them that example and teach them the concept that you and your stakeholders try and create an environment of what we call intellectual stimulation. Don't provide all the answers, but ask the right questions for them to think and find their own answers. So that's one example. Another example. Another example is in Badr. I call it, I call Badr what happened, the metaphorical school of Badr. Because Badr, as a, as a battle, we know about it. But the learning lessons from Badr are enormous. And they really constitute what we call it a metaphorical school in Badr. So imagine you please imagine, it's like you, you're seeing a film uh, or, 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 or I don't know. Uh, the, the battle scene has ended, 
the message. I think it's the name of the movie. Message, right? The message. The message, yes. The message, the message you so get. From the theme, from the, from, from, from and the message. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> the battle has ended. There is an overwhelming uh, victory for Muslims. There are 70 captives of Quraysh. And everyone is feeling exalted, happy, excited, unexpected victory. The Prophet ﷺ is walking and inspecting the captives of Quraysh, the pagans. And it seems out of context, out of reality, the Prophet ﷺ said, as in the hadith, had al mutain ibn Uday been alive and asked me to release these miserable captives, I would have freed them for him. Imagine all the companions are around the Prophet. They are inspecting these captives. Everyone is very happy. And the Prophet announces such a statement. Had al mutain ibn Uday been alive, and asked me to release these miserable captives, I would have obliged. Now, wallah is the big question, why? Why did he say this at this particular time in this context? Someone must be asking why? Because to some of the companions, it may have seemed out of context. Why? al mutam ibn Uday died six months before the Battle of Badr. And he died as a pagan. He was an unbeliever. Okay? So that's a second strange thing. So why would the Prophet mention someone who died as a pagan six months ago, feeling a kind of obligation towards him, saying, had he been alive and asked me to release these miserable captives, I would have obliged. Someone ought to ask the question, why? This, ladies and gentlemen, of course you have to refer to what al mutaim did. al mutaim was a pagan, but he was the one who protected the Prophet ﷺ when he wanted to return to Mecca from his journey to At-Tariq, to Malkus. Quraysh were about to attack him and kill him. Had it not been for al mutain and his sons who announced their protection of the Prophet. So the Prophet was allowed to enter Mecca uh, in safety because of al mutains intervention in his favor. That's number one. Secondly, al mutain was the one who protested against the sanctions that Quraysh uh, applied to the Muslims in Mecca. And he was one of those people who tore the uh, covenant that was signed by Quraysh against the Muslims. So al mutaim had many noble acts in favor of the Muslims, even though he was not a believer himself, he was a pagan. So analyzing this statement, I would probably say that it was a moment wherein the Prophet chose to bring attention to the values that al mutaim represented. Values so well cherished by Muslims themselves throughout their history. Which values? Integrity, loyalty, fairness, and respect of noble conduct. It was also an attempt to make an historical illustration. Uh, is, is, is any of you studying psychology? Psychology? You have something in psychology called principled reasoning. Concept of principled reasoning. So if you want to teach a child or a human being, how to follow an ethical rule, you create 
you create in their mind something called principled reasoning. Why is it good to do that and why is it bad not to do that? In psychology, this is called principled reasoning. So this is, was exactly what the Prophet was doing in that moment after Badr. He was creating the concept of principled reasoning because I'm sure that several of the companions asked themselves, why did he say this about al mughal And the answer would have been, probably later on, not immediately, the answer would have been quite clear and obvious because the Prophet wanted to point out to those values I mentioned integrity, loyalty, fairness, nobility of conduct, and this is a process of what we call principled reasoning. So you train your community, you train your followers that these are the good things to follow and to recognize. In psychology, that's what it is. So anyhow, those companions, ladies and gentlemen, were trained by the Prophet to be values-based leaders themselves in that, in that context. Now, I can go on and on and on. There are examples which uh, there are literally, uh, at least I have compiled about 170 plus hadith relating to values-based leadership. And this is only part of the job, not the whole job. Imagine if you can continue, you can create really a resource material which we can use in schools, in hospitals, in other social institutions, in foundations where values-based leadership can thrive and can become a good practice for everyone to benefit not just us now but also the future uh, generations. I should leave it at that. I think I have spoken enough. Uh, and as I said, um, if any of you is interested in this subject, please uh, communicate with me uh, on my email and I'm happy to provide um, more information to you. By the way, this area of research um, has become now more popular. Uh, Professor Abdul, uh, Abdul Wahid Durwe uh, in Jordan, he developed it also with some of the students and they are actually, as he mentioned in one of his lectures, they are actually now doing uh, research at PhDs level on linking the uh, Islamic values and especially the seerah of Prophet Muhammad to uh, what we call contemporary uh, uh, business uh, settings and how you, you relate the two. Uh, so it is a, it's a growing subject. Uh, I hope I have brought that to your attention and if you have further um, uh, interested in it, I'm quite happy to provide information and background to you. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's stop there. Doctor, what is summarize uh, literature about Yiddish? Not all literature, but various based literature uh, in a good way. And also emphasize the importance of values for organization platforms. Always feel have dilemma. If they are ethical, we will be successful or not in organizational results. Uh, he showed in a good way, yes, if you are uh, ethic-based behaviors, you will also be successful as an organization. Also, the concept of engagement is a very important concept, according to me. Not satisfaction or involvement. We are talking about engagement. In Turkish, nishanlı, the best word. Engagement, <laughs> engagement yes. Uh, that's very important. Uh, and all leaders try to develop engagement in the organization. Emphasize. Also, authentic leadership uh, summarized and uh, dimensions of authentic leadership. And role models are very important. That he uh, put his perspective, Islamic perspective, that's very important. Uh, mainly, he uh, elaborates in detail. We can find some resource material, some role model behaviors from the life of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, and uh, give some examples. Those are examples. 
We have some responsibility to develop those, uh, use those resources and develop new type of leadership in uh, current times in, uh, in our organizations. Uh, this is a basic point in uh, mainstream academia. Most of the time we talk about leadership, like threat approach, behavior approach, or uh, situation approach, transformation leadership, uh, servant leader, etc. But uh, we must also focus the leadership, authentic leadership, uh, mainly. A good example for our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as as a person and also as a leader, he is a good example. Thank you very much for this presentation. Now uh, we want to give chance for comment, questions, or any opinion or evaluation for the presentation. First, your name and then question. Yes. My name Professor. is Bosch Mayim I have just one objection to what you say. Um, Asian academics uh, do not retire, <laughs> by, but, by, but they just uh, give up at necessary tasks. And they continue to inspire and guide us. Thank you. <laughs> that was my objection. Uh, actually, um, uh, there's a one point that I think also is important. I mean, you talk about the leader, leadership. Uh, I'm just thinking loudly. If I'm asked to, uh, if I'm asked a question, and if I have two options to work uh, in a company uh, where there's a good leader, ethical leader, uh, in another company which is based on uh, values, I prefer the values-based organization. But maybe in another strategy, another talk, maybe it's not always looking for the leaders and values-based leaders, but maybe. Very faith organization like like this foundation. I mean, maybe we have leaders, but also they, they, this foundation is based on values, and they do have maybe a long life uh, span than those leaders. Maybe this is also something very important. What do you think about this? Point? Indeed, I I can give you an example, which I thank you for bringing this to the attention also of the audience. I mentioned uh, Fabio Barbosa. Fabio Barbosa, just Googled him, he was the chief executive of a normal uh, bank in Brazil. Uh, but he made a difference. He was a, a lecturer, he started his professional life as a lecturer in a college teaching finance. His first lesson in every year to his students, asking them, why do you want to learn finance? Why do you come to my classes? And of course, the usual answer. To make money. <laughs> make money, better job, you know, better future, etc. He said, absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But do not forget that finance is a discipline in the service of society. Make money, but make money in a way that will make societies better. And he was teaching, his first lesson was to teach his students that finance is a discipline that should be employed in the service of society. So when he became, years later, the head of the bank, he brought his... Uh, executive board and he said to them we can either carry on as we are or we were um, a medium sized bank uh, 25,000 employees that's what they call a medium sized <laughs> medium sized 25,000 employees uh, um, and he said but we shouldn't we should be a bank a new bank for a new society and the executives were not quite in, in line with what, what, what do you mean? I mean, banks basically give loans and they receive interest. And that's what we do. He said, yes, we give loans, we receive interest. That's fine. But we give loans only that will create social progress. And for that, we receive interest and we make profits. So this was his theory. How do we do that? I need you to think with me. How do we do that? So they took three years to develop a new business strategy. Three years. And one of their business strategies, for example, is to uh, withhold.
hold loans to any project that does not satisfy environmental criteria, the bank's environmental criteria. It is recorded that in 2004 they declined 27 applications from borrowers because they do not satisfy these environmental criteria. They created a new business line by giving loans to companies that manufacture water heaters from sun power. And they sold a huge amount of these products and they made profits. So if you look at the bank uh, financial statements uh, between 2004 and 2008, uh, you will see them growing in terms of uh, net profit, in terms of assets, etc., etc., because they managed to create new lines of business, they managed to create trust with the community. So he argues that you can make profit, you can make money while you are serving society. <coughs> And this is a values-based eater. That's one example. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, professor, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Well, uh, actually, I have a couple of uh, you know follow-up questions for you. Please. Uh, maybe uh, it might be helpful for all of us. Uh, first of all, uh, Yani, as uh, Yani, you explained us. Yani, uh, these kind of you know uh, formal conditions, formal principles are really uh, important uh, to specify any kind of organizational system or, uh, as you said, Yani, company. Uh, you know the integrity, the honesty, all of those kind of things. But actually, Yani, uh, it just uh, came to my mind. Uh, yani, what those kind of you know, uh, formal principles sufficient uh, to, you know, shape any kind of uh, economic organization or uh, those kind of things. For instance, uh, you know, uh, especially in these days, uh, yani we are affected uh, from lots of uh, perspectives, uh, from the, you know, Western Enlightenment, Western modernity and those kind of things. And actually, these uh, you know, um, these affections also, uh, you know, gets into our uh, interpretation of values as well. In my in my opinion, correct. For instance, uh, if we ask any kind of you know uh, CEO or any kind of administrator, uh, you know, how about stealing? I mean, would it be uh, would this uh, would someone steal something? Would it be correct, morally, ethically correct or not? Of course, uh, yani, mostly uh, they would say it's wrong, right? But when it comes to, yani, I'm just giving a concrete example mm. to yani, make my uh, purpose specified. Uh, but when it comes to you know, normative actions, uh, yani, people can, in my opinion, yani, deflect, uh, deflect uh, themselves uh, in an easiest way, and they say, "Yani, this is different." But uh, Yani, uh, you know, uh, you, you you get my point, I guess. And uh, because of these kind of things, in my opinion, uh, Yani, to differentiate the Western uh, organizational systems and our uh, Islamic uh, systems, we need to specify more specific, uh, I mean, principles, I guess, to you know determine uh, these principles, uh, uh, to determine connotations of these principles. <coughs> uh, so, what do you think about it? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much for your um, informative, really, question, and, and real, and this is, this is the reality. Um, there is an author of a book called um, um, ethics in management. Mm -hmm. And they highlight the uh, reality sometimes uh, of what you describe. That there is 
a separation between what we believe in and how we act. I'm sorry, uh, could you just uh, remember the author's name? I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. Oh. I'll send it to you. I, I have a copy of the book, and, and there are, I have an old copy, but, I mean, uh, but I'll send it to you. Uh, Ethics in Management. So, for example, corporate social responsibility. She argues that there are two approaches to that. Either what they call a compliance approach, where you have forms and you have a dedicated company officer that looks after your corporate social responsibility, and they tick boxes. Yeah. Uh, like the company donated to charity this much, the company did that much, etc. And it's called a compliance approach. But she recommends a better approach. She recommends it, of course, to the management of the company, to the chairman, to the executive board, to take decisions on that. And that's a, what they call it the values-based approach. So basically, you measure your social, corporate social responsibility according to the values that you have as core business values within your organization and therefore your employees would be responsible for acting within those business values. It all, at the end of the day, and I, this is not my, these are not my words, but the words of the World Economic Forum chairman, saying it all at the end of the day boils down to individual responsibility, those who are leading the organization, and to ethics or their ethics. At the end of the day, it is really... And I gave you the example of Fabio Barbosa. He was a single person who managed to turn that bank into a new bank. But when he left in 2008, there was a new takeover and a new chief executive who forgot all about those uh, ideals and values and turned the bank back into where it was, to a certain extent. A friend of mine tells me about Cadbury. I gave him Cadbury's. Cadbury's is no longer Cadbury because it was acquired by Crafts. A friend of mine who used to work for Cadbury and he was so proud of their corporate values and ethics, he left the company, he resigned because he was disgusted with when the new chief executive came after the takeover, basically and he told me some stories, how they used to mix more sugar with the fizzy drinks, and they don't care about the impact on children's health and the rest of it, just make it more delicious, it will sell more, there was really... So it can change depending on the individual who leads that particular company and his or her vision of a life. Hence my argument about the Islamic concept of because you really need to train individuals who believe in that and who believe of their responsibility and accountability not just in this world but also in the hereafter. Yeah. And not just to stakeholders or shareholders but also to the wider society and humanity. So, you see, the strength, we talk about Islamic civilization having lasted so many centuries. The strength of that why, of course, there was the revelation, there was the belief, these are all strengths. But one other strength is that the Islamic civilization changed the individual by making him or her a better person in terms of his or her belief, and especially in terms of his or her belief in the accountability in the hereafter. So their civilization lasted longer than other civilizations, relatively. So the strength of our call here is to try and change individuals 
to believe that values are important, not just to you, but they are important to you, your family, your children, your grandchildren, the community at large, and the society, and they are important to you, not just in this world, but also in the hereafter. If you can make that change in individuals, then you have an enduring success, civilizational success. That is important. Without that, there is no driving force behind it. I die, it all fades away. So, my response to your question, you're right about your thinking, um, normative <coughs> actions sometimes do not comply or are not consistent with the values that a lot of people hold. But there are rational arguments presented by Rosabeth Moss Cantor. She's saying, if you don't follow this, you will only be successful for a number of years and then you will wither away. So there are rational. Uh, we have examples from Enron and other uh, companies that went bust and uh, were taken into liquidation. We have also the extra dimension of a faith argument mm -hmm. that it would be good for you for your for this world and also for the hereafter. But that I guess is what we can provide. Um, and the argument is that we shouldn't just leave it for the Western sources to educate people about uh, uh, the goodness of ethics and values in business, we should put a faith element into it, uh, an, an element of Iman into it, and it becomes more potent, more effective. That's, that's the argument. Okay, thank you. Let's, let's go on. This, uh, what was your name? Sorry. Uh, Ebubik. Ebubik, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, my sorry. name is Asma. And um, I coincidentally ran into this lecture thanks to the Islamic Muslim <coughs> Collective. I'm visiting from Pakistan and um, I am a human rights barrister by profession, but I'm also an entrepreneur. Um, and I work in my father's factory. And it's very interesting that you bring this up, and I have two parts of my question, which is one part of the question, the other is a comment. The question is what you mentioned in regards to the application of Sira. Yeah in an individual culture. So you mentioned Jordan, there's some work being done over there. My question is that, is there or has there been any successful application of Sira practically in the business so far anywhere around the world? And this is followed by my comment, which is that I come from a city called Sialkot in Pakistan. It's a small industrial estate space. Mm. Um, we produce everything from leather jackets to shoes for Adidas, a 90% production of footballs and bags, Nike, everything is like, it's a huge industrial zone. Okay. And it's a modern one because it was primarily went forward in the 19th century. And interestingly, many of the founders and industrialists were not Western educated. They were Sira based educated. Yes. They were deeply creative. They were very creative individuals, but their <coughs> core ethics and values were based on honesty and hard work. And this was, we call them the four, uh, the founding fathers of Salford. So they were the ones that started the industry in the early 19th, mid 19th century. And now our generation, the third generation that is Western educated and is carrying those industries forward to a new era has absolutely, if not completely lost that bigger and importance of Sira and Islamic application of this. Because we go to all these MBA schools and all these Western schools and then we come back and then, and I do believe that because there was no actual um, business-based foundation for these, the success for including our factory um, was completely and purely and totally based on values of the forefathers. Um, an example of this would be, there's, um, I think football is really big in Turkey. Um, there's this brand called Select. Um, it's, it supplies Bundesliga in Germany. And my, my grandfather signed, uh, he shook hand, he shook his hand with the founder of Select back in the early 19th century. He said that on this basis, we will only produce for you 
and you will only buy from us. And that was the core values of honesty and trust it was based on. There's no written paper. So as a lawyer for me, this was very difficult to understand. And still today, 70 years later, that handshake stands. And his, as you mentioned, that his company's been acquired, it's grown, but that handshake still stands. In fact, it's our 72nd anniversary today, um, where my father has everybody they've bought. So my question is that it is of extreme concern as well for me as a third generation um, in the business. How do we continue to successfully apply Sira into our business dynamics in various countries, be it Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Turkey, and take it forward? Do you think that it should be like an independent training situation, practically speaking, that should be taking place because we are currently, there is in fact a um, center in the city called uh, Sirat Study Center, founded by my late grandfather. It is currently redundant because nobody bothered uh, on focusing on the Sira, but his, the founding fathers, their aim was that we need to focus, as you mentioned, which is what's very interesting, is that we need to focus on the Sira. But I feel like this, this, our generation has this massive gap of where we put Islamic values individually and our business values individually. How do we overlap them successfully, even if we do want to? It's not just there. If you look at, I, I come originally from Baghdad, and I've been to a number of other Muslim capitals. And it's everywhere. I see devout Muslims. Um, and they are sincerely devout Muslims. But their devotion is most clear in the mosque uh, <laughs> or during religious um, occasions and ceremonies. Um, do they carry on that kind of devotion in their clinics, uh, hospitals, schools, factories, wherever they go? Uh, maybe yes, I, I can't deny you know, human goodness at all, but probably not to a productive end. So it, it, it remains personal uh, <coughs> virtue rather than an institutional or organizational culture which is based on those values and traditions and that kind of thing. So, uh, as with, with many other things in Muslim societies, we are lacking. And I remember giving my first ever lecture 10 years ago exactly today, 2012, on the subject. It was in Medina Munawar. Uh, and they invited an audience made of some business leaders. One of them was a Bangladeshi who was a member of the executive committee of the World Islamic Economic Forum. And he was, he was thrilled to learn about this. And he said, you know, we, we want this, he said, but yeah. no one has presented it in, in, in a... In a meaningful contemporary way. Yeah. Um, so yes, I think, uh, I truly think that uh, this effort should continue beyond my lifetime. I hope, uh, when I was in Malaysia as a visiting professor, I tried to get some PhD students to work on it. Um, I'm going everywhere talking about it without shame, without Whatever, I just want to say, this is important, please. Whether you agree or disagree with me, I think it is important. Take it forward. I hope I will one day not be around, but getting the benefit of that knowledge in my grave. Because I want to talk about this. I think it is important, and people should take it. Um, universities, academic institutions, they should turn it into a research program with a hub, because I am, what I'm saying is really only concepts, nothing beyond concepts. If you take these, put them in a program where they can be tested empirically, so you have uh, 
one group in a company, another group in the same company basically without this and with this and test them and get some results to prove that it really makes a difference. That's what an individual or a group cannot do this. It's only universities, academic institutions. But for that, you need to create a momentum of uh, willingness, of acceptance first of all, and then you start. In Jordan, I mention this because this is the only uh, the only experience I knew about. I heard Professor uh, talking about it in a, in fact one of his PhD students was present and he was pointing to him as being the leader in this field doing a PhD on this type of uh, subject or research. So I can assure you it will take decades for this, not just years, decades for it to evolve. But we need that, Muslim societies need that to evolve, and not just in the Sira, but expand it. Imagine if you take the four, five, uh, the four guided caliphs, imagine if you take the life of Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, imagine if you take the life of so many other saints and sages and, and good people throughout Muslim history, you will find it overwhelming in various languages. But it is so I, I, I agree with your comment. You asked me if there is any, any organization. It's not based on the CIRA, but there are uh, corporate uh, companies, businesses, that have taken their values serious. So they have taken the step to initiate a set of corporate values for themselves. Uh, the Savola group in Saudi Arabia is one. Uh, Servico in Malaysia is another uh, waste management uh, company, conglomerate, very big. Uh, they have also some good uh, corporate values. So some of them are taking it, but these are individuals not connected to any intellectual initiative. Okay, one more question, yes. <laughs> So thank you so much for being with us, and welcome back to Scotland. Thank you. So my name is Khaldun, uh, and I'm naturally and professionally interested in social entrepreneurship. I myself am a co-president of an organization called Youth Within Diversity. So I have one question uh, that's bothering me now. Uh, how can we build an ecosystem that is purpose driven and not value based? This is this is my main struggle. Let me turn it around. What are your thoughts? What are your th you must have thought about this. I am not an expert, so I must confess I am limited in what I can offer on this. But what are your thoughts? You heard what I said. How can you benefit from this? How can you turn it to your advantage? Well, we already have our values set our mission and vision for strategic uh, plan. So we have our values. But the problem is how can we instill these values into every individual that, that who's working with us because we have we have our own organization, we have our members, we have volunteers and we have people we influence. So so this is the main issue. How can we be always purpose driven? How can we be value based? How can we always achieve the impact that we are actually intending to have? That's that's clear. Uh, we are not the only people who face such a, a dilemma. Um, there is some work that uh, has been done and published by Professor Kramer um, in the US. Uh, I can also send you the, the reference to that. Um, he published a book called uh, From Values to Action. Um, Harry Kramer, his name is. Harry Kramer. Um, and it's a good attempt. Uh, it's, a, it's a very nice approach. Uh, he said, in a nutshell, the first step to move from abstract values to 
value action is to create serious self-reflection of the individual or of the leader. And he called it regular self-reflection. So it's not a one-off, but you regularize it. How long? It's up to you. It could be once a month, it could be once a year, it could be whatever. What do you mean by self-reflection? Ah. So you sit, basically, on your own, you write down your core values, Suppose you write integrity, accountability, compassion, whatever, your core, core um, business values. Or, and then next to it, you say, how do I turn that abstract value into action in my workplace? So you ask yourself the question, and you exercise yourself in writing the answer. How do you turn trust from a value that you believe in into an organizational culture of trust? But there's a problem with the workspace because a workspace is not an office, it's the society or the social space in general. It doesn't have to be. So you, you start with your, even if it's a virtual organization, you start with that virtual organization. How do I create a, an environment, an organizational culture that thrives on trust? So it is your duty to think it through. And, and Professor Kramer talks about how important this self-reflection, regular self-reflection is for leaders in order to turn their organizations into, into, into ethical or, or value-based organizations. Then he talks about it's important for the leader to have or to realize what they call personal humility. So if they realize personal humility, then they would seek advice from people around them without any hesitation. Okay? And through that advice, maybe they will get something beneficial in which they can implement. So he insists on a good step of a good dose of personal humility. So in his book he describes actually, for, and he, he talks about balance. So balance in life in general. Uh, so there are four uh, requirements which he lists down in the book. He then qualifies his argument in a very nice way. He says, if you are not self-reflective, how can you lead yourself? How do you know your strengths, your weaknesses, what you lack, what you bring to the table, what you want to improve? If you're not self-reflective, how can you lead yourself? If you cannot lead yourself, how can you lead others? So it's, it's a very rational approach, uh, prompting people, leaders, in any uh, professional setting, not necessarily, professional setting is the right word, um, to, to exercise that, sit down, write their core uh, values, and think through how will they turn this from abstract notions into something that is implemented within well, mashallah, you are a blessed uh, professor. Because, no, because because the fourth, the four, I mentioned four, I mentioned three out of four. The fourth is self-discipline. He said leaders will require self-discipline in order to do that. So that's you. You you read Harry Kramer and his his book um, from values to action. Okay. Uh, one more question, yes. <laughs> this is real one more question, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me write my email. Uh, uh, last question, yes. <laughs> ah, here. If, if you want, it's, up, it's entirely optional. So it's, uh, it's BMW, because I like the car. <laughs> But it's, it's Basel Mustafa. It just happens to be BMW 
zero four zero six fifty nine at gmail dot com. BMW zero four zero six fifty nine at gmail dot com. <laughs> so this is the email if you want to uh, carry on correspondence. Okay, yes, last question. Yes. In a short time, please. Uh, Professor, actually I just wanted to add something to what was said. Uh, my name is Sarah and I am the
Uh, that's very important and we believe. But also we have organizations we cannot control totally. Also, ecosystem we are talking about, transforming those into practice and this ecosystem is not so easy. But we will not give up. We will insist to develop our organizations to new ecosystem. Inshallah, we can do. If you do what we can do, Allah will help us, we believe. Thank you very much again for your joining us and also Dr. Basim Mustafa. For presentation for those questions, uh, important questions. Thank you very much again. We have a small gift for today, <laughs> the of today. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you I will cherish this, inshallah, and value it. Mashallah. Mashallah. Thank you.